Okay. Do you need help, Sherry? No, no, no. Okay. Remind me to talk to you if you find Kevin, you run out. There is somebody that will talk to you. Oh, okay. Okay. If you get this. Okay. Randy Roger? It's running. It's running. Okay. It is Wednesday, March. Oh, good. Michelle. 27. It is Wednesday, March 27. We are picking up in Revelation 19 and verse 21. Just a quick recall of verse 20 so that we know where we're coming from. We've been talking about the fact that the false prophet and the Antichrist both have been cast alive into the lake of fire. That they did not die first. Their souls were not separated in death where the body goes into a grave and the soul goes into the holding tank, I'll call it, for lack of uh, wanting to spend too much time right now for the end say. They're not waiting for that time at the end of time when they're going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment or their judgment. Apparently their, their works are so evil that God does not even wait for that judgment to come, but he just casts them alive into the lake of fire. We'll see that they're still there, which does away with the idea of annihilation. They're still there a thousand years later. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Notice this is the exact opposite of the rapture, where we're caught up alive to meet the Lord in the air. They are caught alive and cast down into the lake of fire. Exact opposite. Two deaths. Now, two deaths. The, the second death, yes, yeah, there is already, yes. Um, two deaths at once, yes, in essence, yes. Okay. Now, we know that this is at the time that Messiah has returned, that he's going to, well, he has, we've just studied through it, stopped the enemies of Israel, the sword out of his mouth has annihilated the enemies. We see that it is about time, because we know what's coming, we know that the Millennial Kingdom is what we're coming right into. And what I want to point out is that, because we see in chapter 20, the Millennium, and we're right there, 21 is the last verse of 19, and then we're into 20, this proves wrongly called post-millennialism. Now, I'll go into that in just a bit more when we start chapter 20, but the idea is that the world is in a wonderful state, and the Messiah returns to this wonderful state and sets up his kingdom. Well, I don't call Armageddon wonderful. I don't call the, the blood that, that uh, up to the horse's bridle 200 miles long. I don't ca call the great supper or the supper of the great God that the vultures have come from all over to pick the flesh off of the dead bodies because there's so many that can't be buried fast enough that pestilence and disease would be there. That's not a pretty sight. This is not coming back to a world that is welcoming and saying how wonderful. Yes, at the moment of his return, when they are seeing him, Israel does finally turn, see the Messiah, and, and some, I believe, on a dime, turn for their salvation. Others have been believing it, been hanging on and waiting for that return, because it does say that they'll see him who they pierce, they will mourn. So there is some who, at that moment, are crying in their, in their, um, the, their sad tears. You know, they're, they're mournful, and they're ready to receive. There are those who wow, we made it through, that are going to be so thrilled. They're the ones that are going to be saying, Baruch HaBav Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That the world is not prepared, ready, and lovely, and beautiful for him. Now, again, we'll hit that more later, but let's, let's look at what's happened, because the Lord's come back, we know he has stopped the battle, we know that there's a huge number slain, we know that the false prophet and the, the Antichrist have now been cast into the lake of fire. We talked last week also about the uh, Antichrist who had this uh, Satan indwelling him, that apparently Satan separates from him before he's cast in the lake of fire, because we're going to have to see that Satan, Satan has to be dealt with right now. And we will see that. And let's look at verse 21 of Revelation 19, and we read... We are. We're going to, to there with this verse. We have to read 21 to go to Thessalonians. So we know why we're going to Thessalonians. <laughs> okay? And that's why I told you we'll start in Revelation 19, but the first cross reference will be in 2 Thessalonians. Sorry if I messed you up. 19, 21. The, the very end of 19, chapter 19, verse 21. 
And it says the rest were killed with the sword that goes out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. Now we saw that up earlier, the rider on the horse, verse 11, and I think it also tells us in 19, I think it is. We know very clearly the one on the horse is the Lord, is the Messiah, is the, the Savior. Uh, and well, and I'll say Messiah because he's coming back to Israel as Messiah at this point. That the, the rest have been killed with the sword that goes out of his mouth, and all the birds gorge themselves on their flesh. That's what I was just talking about last week. We looked at that. I'll tell you, that's a foul thing to look at. <laughs> okay. That's what's going on there. Now let's go to Second Thessalonians. And I see I went to first. Uh, Michelle, yes. I mean, this, this book says how uh, said there was going to be blood up to the horse's bridle. So it's going to soak down, but how is it going to be clean? Does it say? It does not say, other than there will have to be a purification going on. We know that the, the implements of war are going to be burned. We know that there's going to be those who it's their job to go through and bury the bones that are left. Uh, and then people will even go through the land again. And if they see bones that were missed, they'll put up a sign. How could the bones be missed? Maybe because of the blood, maybe because it is being absorbed. Yeah, I, I, it does not say how. It's, it is going to be, you know, devastating. Yes. Um, well, bones doesn't stink if they're dry. Why do they bother to bury them? <laughs> Would you like to have dead bones laying all around forever? Well, I've seen it in the desert. Right, there'll be a lot of change. We don't have the total renewal, brand new, fresh that will come after the millennium, but it definitely is going to go back more like the Garden of Eden, you know, where it's going to be lush and they'll, if they come up, they get rain, you know, they're not going to be dealing with all the effects that we're dealing with now because we know creation's even been waiting to be released, that it's even millennium. So um, God can supernaturally dry up that blood. How did he supernaturally, Yeshua I'm talking about, take his blood three days after he resurrected? How did he take his blood, put it on the mercy seat in heaven? But yet I know he did because scripture tells me he did. So he does amazing things with blood. And I'll just put it that way. He's an amazing God. Yes, he is. Amen. Um, so we'll watch and we'll see together and find out how he deals with it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, it tells us, Then the lawless uh, one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. So we know this is talking about that same time, okay? The beginning of the, the verse, then the lawlessness will be lawless one will be revealed, refers to the verses up ahead. It's telling that these things, this is the order it's going to happen in. That's not the part of the verse we're in. Obviously, we're seven years later because we're at the end, and we're seeing his slay. How is he slay? By the breath, out of his mouth, at the appearance of his coming. So the Antichrist will make it all the way to the end of the tribulation to be killed by the sword out of the mouth of the Lord, and, uh, uh, and, and all will see that because that's at his appearing. When it talks about his appearing, the world is seeing him. That is his second coming. Remember, do not confuse second coming and rapture. They are two totally different events. I heard a teaching here recently, so if I get on my soapbox on a few of these things in my next few classes, you all are going to hear it. Because when I hear the lies being spoken of out there, it just infuriates me, and I have to speak against it. And it's poking fun at those of us who believe in the first coming and the second coming and the third coming as they're putting it and that's what they're calling our rapture that that's the second coming and then this would be the third no and you never hear us refer to it that way when he stops in the clouds in the air and the world down here does not see him that's not a coming that's not like the first coming in the first coming did he stop in the air no. Did he put his feet literally on earth? Yes. yes. Did he put literally, did he put literally in Jerusalem, in Nazareth, in Galilee, in Capernaum? Was he in all of these places? Yes. yes, we know it. So if he's going to come again in like 
manner. He's going to come down to the earth. He's going to put his feet down on earth. Everyone will see. What happens in the air says he comes for his saints. Now, what if we just been reading Revelation 19? Who comes back with him? We, we do. Amen. We do. We do. So obviously, we got to be up there first to come back with him, and it can't be the same event because if we're down here, how could I mean God can do anything? But are you kidding me? He's going to snatch it. It doesn't work. We know it doesn't. Our common sense it just doesn't work. So we see a first coming. Now, I should have probably gotten this out. We're going to use it several times today, so I'll put it out. We see a first coming. We see a second coming. In between those events, we have what we call the rapture. Is that word in Scripture? Yeah, no. 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 no, it's not. Neither is Trinity. Neither is a lot of the words of what we believe in. So that's what people will also throw at you. They will say, oh, well, rapture was until 1500s. No, the word rapturo out of the Latin came in the early hundreds, but it's just the name they gave it. Paul called it, thank you. <laughs> Paul called it the great, not the great, he said the snatching away, or the catching away. You want to call it that? Call it that. I have no problem with that. It doesn't matter the name we put on it, the title we put on it, it's the teaching. It's the teaching. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I think uh, because we're thinking of our naturalness. What would it be thinking when, when Jesus rose up, up there, and we are still here, the body is here, it's, it's got to be connected, the body has to be connected there, not here. Can you, can you understand? That's the body has to be connected thing, up yeah. there. Huh? His body has to be connected up there, yes, yes, the yes. head's up there. Yes. That's okay. All. okay. All right. If you look at the red, just look at the red, that's all we're talking about. First coming is that first red line that has the cross because the first coming was the deal with sin. When he came, died on the cross, buried, rose again. Forty days later, the second line, he ascended, well actually the first line. Here's his earthly life. Here he ascends into heaven. When he ascends up into heaven, forty days after his death, burial, resurrection, ten days later, he sends the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, down to indwell. This is Acts 2. The first time he told them, wait until you're empowered. And they're empowered by the power of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, Red's dealing with all God, Holy Spirit, um, and the Son. You know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, three in one. Okay? So, our next rep, here's where we are now. We're in what's called the church age. Then our next rep is him coming in the air. We are caught up to meet him in the air. First Amen. Thessalonians 4. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. First Corinthians 15 also talks about it. Kill two, and we'll scoot. We're out of here. I think it's passing for those of you. Okay, so that's what he's done here. Now, seven years of tribulation on the earth after we've been caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We're not here to argue that point today. I'm just going to say it's fact because as far as I'm concerned, I can back it up with every single scripture and every scripture that's ever been thrown at me. For any other view, I can refute. So I'm going to call it fact in my class, okay? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> he comes back down, and notice he comes all the way down to the earth the same way. It, well, not that line, sorry, that's the Holy Spirit. The same way here, he was all the way down here and ascended in heaven. He comes all the way back at the Battle of Armageddon, stops the Battle of Armageddon, throws that prophet, false, and that Christ anti. The Antichrist and the false prophet. We don't have anything on here that shows it. Out into the lake of fire. It's off the map. Okay? At this time, you've got a line here that's representing Satan. He's the prince of the power of the air. Principalities of, of powers in high places that we're fighting against. He and his cohort. That's through our age. It's through the ages all along. When we get to this point where the Lord has returned at second coming, just before the millennial kingdom, thousand year reign. And how do we get that name? Revelation 20, six times in what, 15 verses? Thousand years, thousand years, thousand. You're going to think I'm a broken record and I'm going to be reading the next verse. <laughs> okay? That millennial means thousand. So that's how we get that name. 
Just before the Millennial Kingdom starts, we're going to see, and we're right there, we'll talk about it as soon as we're done with verse 21. Satan is going to be bound in the bottomless pit below the earth where he cannot wreak his havoc during this time like he has all the way through this time from Adom to the last one at the, at the point of Armageddon, okay? But that only lasts for a little time, and he comes back up to something called Gog and Magog. We'll talk about it in detail. But for those of you who know or have heard, he's let loose for a little time, gathers those who want to follow him as God instead of the one true and living God. They're going to come up in the face of the Lord to come against him, to, to dethrone him. God has a final word. And whoosh, into the lake of fire goes Satan, and the judgment for all those who have followed comes here to the great white throne judgment. That's this black line. Everyone who has died from the beginning all the way through time, this is the second death. It says for the believer, the second death does not touch them. But for the unsaved, they are part of what's called the second death. And they will come and stand before God to be judged here before they're cast in the lake of fire. So that somehow, in some way, even though hell is hell, there's still going to be a greater so, uh, amount of suffering for a Hitler, Saddam Hussein, Assad, these horrible people, than someone who's tried to live a good life and not hurt anybody. Okay? We'll talk about all of this in detail in chapters 20, 21, and then 22 will give us our future. Mm -hmm. How about okay? that? You will see this in an object that I will bring in, a 3D object. This is the New Jerusalem that hovers over the earth during the Millennial Kingdom. And we'll talk about all those colors. We'll talk about these little dots. <laughs> we'll talk about all of that when I bring in the, the 3D and when we're in chapter 21. Anyone who wants to cheat and look ahead, I have no problem. I've read the final chapter. You want to read it? Go for it. See it all its glory. That's fine. Chapter 21 will deal with that. Thank you. We may need to pull it back up and down a couple times today, but they may have it in their minds too. Any questions? Have I confused? Left anybody out? Are they good? Okay. Then back to where we are, we've got that the false prophet and the Antichrist have been cast into the lake of fire. The Antichrist has been destroyed by the sword out of the, the mouth of um, the Lord when he returned. I'm going to read a little more on in 2 Thessalonians. If you didn't stay there, don't worry about it. I'll read it for you. It says, that is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan. Now, it's talking about the Antichrist. When I jump in there and I've divided, I, I throw you for a loop because you got to know who I'm talking about, okay? Actually, actually, let me stand corrected. It's going to also talk about the false prophet, um, the one with all power and signs and false wonders with the deception, all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. If I just confuse you all, what it's saying is that, uh, okay, you know, I should have just stayed with it and done it in order. We've got the Antichrist. He has led people astray. He and his false prophet both have been lying wonders, what looked like miracles, signs that made people follow them, thinking, hey, this is God. Only God could do this. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth. They chose not to believe, and so they were deceived. Remember it says that there will be such a strong delusion set out that it would even catch the saved if it were possible. But it's not possible. The saved will not be caught by it. That, that is who that they are talking about because they would not believe the truth. They swallowed this lie. For this reason, oh yeah, verse 11 said it. For this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged, that's at the great white throne, who did not believe the truth, not as the next phrase, but to pleasure in wickedness. Mm -hmm. What I'm reading into that is not just the evil ones who loved what they were doing, but what it's showing is the heart. The heart was not pleased to follow the Lord. The heart was pleased to follow the lie. The heart was pleased to be a part of the wickedness. This is what God judges. He judges that heart. And that's why, as we were talking earlier, it's not that someone is condemned who would have come to the Lord later. No. 
He knows when they will not, when that final rejection has been made. And at this point in time, when he returns, time is no more. So if they have not chosen by that point, then they, in essence, made their choice by not choosing. To not choose is to choose. Yeah. It's just to right. choose the wrong side. Okay, how are they killed? It said they're killed by the sword. The sword we know is the word of God. We know it from several places. On our way back to Revelation, let's stop off at Hebrews. We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to go to verse 12. In Hebrews 4, 12, we read, for the word of God. Okay, we're talking about the same thing, the word of God. It is living. It is active. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. You know the verse. Piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit. We can't even decide how to tell the difference between the soul and the spirit when we're talking from our human. We know that, that one tries to say one's emotions and one's who we really are. But in essence, we don't know how to separate. It is such a fine line. Only God knows how to separate that. And yet his sword pierces the separation. Between the joints and the marrow, the marrow is what's inside the bone. So to divide so to that point that you're cutting right through, slicing right through, what it's saying is it's the finest line. And yet God can de decide and decipher between. The word of God comes in that way and is able then to judge the thoughts, the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. All things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He sees it all. He knows it all. He knows the depths of their hearts. Anyone can fool the people some of the time. Some of the people can fool people all of the time, but no one can fool God any of the time. <laughs> okay. Ephesians, we're backward. We'll get back to Revelation. Ephesians 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll pick up at verse 17. Ephesians 5, 6, 17. And we read, take the helmet of salvation and the spirit, which is the word of God. Again, the word of God is the spirit, is the sword, is, is, is how do I say it? End of my words. Isaiah, Yeshia. Why do I take you to several sources? Oh, very good, very good. I heard it from all of you. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. Anytime anyone wants to say to you, oh, that's one verse of scripture, you're pulling it out of context and you're building a whole yeah. belief system, I want you to be able to say, no, I'm not. Ephesians said it. Hebrews said it. Revelation said it. God said it in many times through many people. We're going to get long and hard on the promises to Israel called the Millennial Kingdom. I'm going to give you prophet after prophet. We're going to list them on the board because I want you to be so strong in what you know because God said it. And I want you to be able to, to spew this to those who are preaching that evil that Israel's been replaced. Mm -hmm. The Jew is done with. I'm one proof that, they, that that's not true. But I want you to be able to say to them, if God said it in the mouth of Yeshia, if God said it in Daniel's mouth, in Amos' mouth, and in, in Hezekiel's mouth, if God said it in this many mouths, and he doesn't hold to his word, what does that do for me as a believer for what it's called the church today. If God's not going to do what he said he's going to do for Israel, and he said it here, and he said it here, and he said it here, and he said it here. Wow, we got a lot of scripture we've got a problem with if it's not true, not fulfilled to the last little, in English, dot of I and cross of the T. So I'm going to make sure we know our foundation. We know why we believe it. We know that he isn't out of Rochelle's mouth. It's never out of Rochelle's mouth. That you don't find a book written by Rochelle. <laughs> no, wait a minute. God was smarter than that. <laughs> but I quote out of the mouth of those who were inspired by the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And it amazes me that you can take the Bible and put it on, on um, test, on, you know, judge it. And I don't care what walk of life they come from. I don't care what background. I don't care how many hundreds of years apart. You cannot find a disagreement. When you can have a book written over so many hundreds of years by over 40 authors from I don't remember how many walks of life. I can get you those facts that I'm at the top of my fingertips today, but I can get them for you. And it all comes together. It's all cohesive. It's all preaching one testimony. 
I can stake my, my life on that now. And I have. And I will. And I'll take it all the way to the bank. And I will come out <laughs> with the biggest smile. A winner. <laughs> yes. And you all along with me. Yeshia, Isaiah 11, verse 4. Isaiah 11 and verse 4. Oh, Isaiah 11. Oh, okay. All right, chapter. I'm having trouble. I did it backward. 11 and verse 4. And we read that with righteousness he will judge the poor, decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. When does that happen? Isaiah wrote oh, yeah. 700 BC. Did it happen in Isaiah's day? No. Did it happen when Messiah was here first time? No. No. Did it happen in Shaul Paul's day? No. Has it happened today? No. But have we studied it? Oh, yes. Not yet. Have we studied it? Do we see him with a rod out of his mouth slaying the wicked? Yes. So there you go. Now go back to me with me in Revelation, but stop off at chapter 1. We've done chapter one so long ago. For any who were not here or any who do not remember, one is an absolute amazing description. Does it describe God the Father? Yes. Does it describe God the Son? Yes. Yes. Can you tell me which verses are for which? <laughs> That's a trick question. <laughs> because we see the intertwining so well all the way through it. In chapter one, all the events. <laughs> In chapter 1 and verse 16, we are talking about Yeshua, the Messiah. We see that in his right hand, he held seven stars. Out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Can you look at the sun? Can you imagine in all his strength that literally the blindness, the glory of the Lord is even greater? No wonder Moshe could only see what was left behind. No wonder even that made him glow. Okay, so this is when we're talking about, obviously, when we go back to chapter 19, and we see that the sword is coming out of his mouth, we know very clearly that we are speaking of Yeshua. This is his second coming because his feet are on earth. We see that he came to the Valley of Armageddon. We saw the difference in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. We looked at that, all the areas of Megiddo, that, where the battle was going on and culminated in Jerusalem, that he literally comes onto the Mount of Olives, and his feet... Uh, that hit the mountain, all of there's an earthquake, earthquake that cleaves that mountain in two, that makes the biggest valley there's ever been, north and south, separated from east and west, comes from the earth, because we're going to have a great big temple coming to that area. So we know that's the timing it's talking about, and that correlates and ties in back here with us in Revelation 21, that the one who sat on the horse with the sword out of his mouth that slayed the wicked, then can be none other than who Yeshia said it was, who uh, Paul said it was. I guess that's the only two I use this time because Hebrews and Ephesians both were by Shaul Paul. But then Yochanan. So we've got Isaiah, 700 BC. We've got Paul in the first century AD. We've got Yochanan about 95 AD. And we stand here to testify today. It has not happened yet. It will come. It will be the second coming of the one that we call Yeshua, Jesus, who came the first time. So he has come and he's on his horse. He has done this. And we know that there is a great carnage from the Battle of Armageddon because it says all the birds were filled with their flesh. This was that huge supper that we talked about before. Because they're eating the flesh, they're leaving the bones behind. Birds don't eat. <coughs> and we're talking the vultures and the ravens and you know, the crows and that type. They don't eat the bones. That's why it says that they're eating the flesh. And you know what? There are scriptures that talk about them being filled with the blood also. So when they're asking what happened to the blood, they're going to also take in the blood. Yeah, it does say it. Um, I think it's in Ezekiel. In fact, we're going to go there. So it may be coming up. Go with me to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 39. This also was the battle of Armageddon that has ended. This is what's happening on the earth after it. Uh, Ezekiel is a book in order also. <coughs> Uh, chronologically, when you look at it, chapter 37 had um, Israel return to the land. Um, they are the dry bones, no spirit in them. That's where we are today. Israel's been returned to her land, fulfilled Isaiah 66, 6 and 7, or 7 and 8. 
go to Isaiah 6, 6, 7, you'll get the right place. <laughs> Where it says, can a nation be born in a day? Yes. Israel was born in a day. Yes. Okay, fulfillment. Again, fulfillment of Yeshia, Isaiah's words, Ezekiel, Ezekiel's words. 37, they're, they're in the land. 38, 39, battle of Armageddon. Repeatedly in 38, 39, you have the phrase that now the, the world will know, or now all of Israel will know, I am the Lord their God. I am the Lord God. When does the world know this? When does Israel know this? Do they know it today? No. Do they know it in the middle of the tribulation? No. They're still crying out. They're still battling against God. There's a time when they turn and they blaspheme God still. And again, even out of their their misery, because remember the sores that, that it was talking about, they were so miserable. Instead of turning and crying for, for salvation, for mercy, for redemption, they blaspheme God. The only time when this world will know and recognize and Israel will say this is the Lord our God and be pleased to say it is at the end of the tribulation. So 38, 39 is a culmination. You see battle Armageddon all over these chapters, but I do not believe it happens in the midpoint. In the midpoint, the believers are the ones who will flee that are living in Yerushalayim, the, uh, the um, of abomination, the, okay, the abomination of desolation. Wow. Matthew 24, 15, split in the temple. When the Antichrist puts his image in the temple and says, now you worship me, this is it. This is the time when he's going to be bringing that mark. Now you take my mark, or it's it. Then the believers are told, get out, flee. Again, we don't read of a war there, and we don't read of him coming and stopping that war. That would be in the middle. That doesn't fit there. But he tells them, flee. We believe that they flee down into Petra. That correlates with Yeshia, Isaiah, that where God tells them, when the indignation is being poured out, indignation is wrath, that they need to come and hide for a little while until the indignation is full, until it's filled, until it's completed. If there was a rapture, if there was a second coming, then God would say, look up, your redemption draws nigh, but he doesn't. Hide yourself for a little while. Hide. So they go and they hide. And then we're told in the second coming also, we haven't looked at the scriptures yet, but we will be in time, that they're going to come back from the four corners of the earth, that the Lord is going to bring them back. He has put his hand over Edom and Moab and um, Ammon, I think it says. Well, what happens to be in that area? Petra. Is he his hand over his people that hid for a time? I believe so. And now that he's back in second coming and going to set up the millennial kingdom, he brings them back. And it says that he sends his angels out to bring them back from the four corners of the earth. So when does all of Israel finally return to Israel? At the end of the tribulation and going into the millennium. There is foreshadowing, there is starting, there is a tag in it. I think every true heart to go home. <laughs> but it will be fully fulfilled in that time. Okay, so if the Hezekiel, we're back to that end of the battle of Armageddon. In verse 30... In chapter 39, in verse 10, it says, They will not take wood from the field or gather firewood from the forest, for they will make fires with the weapons. The weapons of war that were used in the Battle of Armageddon is what they're going to be burning. They're going to burn all those implements. Remember it says they beat their swords in the plowshares? So instead of it being a sword to kill somebody, it's going to be to, to furrow the land so they can plant crops and have food. It's a good use. It's taking what was meant for war and now feeding the people instead of famine that follows war. And here it is telling us that they'll uh, take uh, no wood. They don't need wood. They're going to burn the weapons, and they will take the spoil of those who just spoiled them, seize the plunder of those who plundered them. So it's a total turnaround. Those who were plundering are done. They're, they're done, but they are gone. Drop down to verse 15. We're staying in the same time, though, the same thing. If you read it through every verse, it's just I don't want to read the whole chapter. I'm trying to hit the highlights. Verse 15, as those who pass through the land pass through and anyone sees a man's bone, he will set up a marker by it until the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamadog. And even, well, that we can stop with 15. We don't have to read 16. Okay, so there's a, there are certain people that are the barriers. They're going to go through and they're going to bury the bones. I'll explain why there are certain people in just a moment. Let me go through this first and then I'll come to, to the scripture for that. Verse 17, as for you, son of man, notice in your English it's the little s. It's not, he's not talking to Messiah. He's talking to 
the, on the earth here, to the earth of people. Thus says the Lord God, speak to every kind of bird and to every beast of the field, telling them, assemble, come, gather from every side of my sacrifice, which I'm going to sacrifice for you as a great sacrifice, where? On the mountains of Israel. They, here it is, um, Dora, here's your verse. That you may eat flesh and drink blood. So there's where some of, at least some of the blood will go. Okay. Yeah. Nancy. And look at verse 20. You will be glutted at my table with horses and chariots with mighty men and all the men of war declares the word of God. Glutted? That makes me think of gluttony. That means they're going to gorge themselves. I, I just picture this bird getting fatter and fatter. You know, oh my goodness. Believe me, I want a berry pound. I want a gentleman. Okay. Uh, verse 21. And I will set my glory. There's where my eyes are going to be, folks. I will set my glory among the nations. And the nations will see my judgment, which I've executed. My hand, which I have laid on them. He's putting his hand out on the nations. They are going to get whatever judgment is theirs. Those that come up against Israel are going to suffer consequences for it. We'll read more of that also as we go into the millennial time. And the house of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God from that day onward. Now that verse alone is enough for me to say, how can anybody put that in the middle of the tribulation? Yet you'll hear that from sermon after sermon after sermon. I don't see from the middle of the tribulation on. That's all the rest of our seals that, that we talked about. Remember you have the... Okay, what's the order? The last ones that come out are the bowls. Okay, you have all the bowls to go. I do not see the Lord know, uh, the Lord, excuse me, sorry Lord. I do not see Israel know that the Lord is her God at that point. But do I see it here now when he's put his feet on the Mount of Olives, set up his judgment, his kingdom to rule and to judge from, and his control over the land, ruling and reigning? Do they know every day of the millennium that the Lord is their God? Yes, absolutely they know it. So here's why I put it here again. If I'm on my soapbox, it's because so much out there is going to tell you different. I want you to see it here. They will know, all the house of Israel will know, I am the Lord their God from that day onward. The nations will know that the house of Israel went into exile for their iniquity and because they acted treacherously against me. So I hid my face from them. So I gave them into the hand of their adversaries, and all of them fell by the sword. What did we just read through the book of uh, the book? <laughs> okay, through Revelation, through the period of the tribulation. Did we not read this? That that they were falling by the sword. That the, and we know what the Antichrist does when he comes up against them. We do see God hid His face for a time, but do we notice God came back to Israel? He did not leave her forever. He came in the body of Messiah to fulfill his promises. So, yes, for a time, they're suffering because of their iniquity. How many of you had kids? <laughs> have, you, have you child trained those kids? Have you let them suffer the consequences of their actions that they might learn from them? But did you still love them? Yes. Were they still your kid? Yes. And did you have your arms wide open when they said, Mom, Dad, I want back? Did you wrap around your arms and say, Hallelujah? <laughs> this is what it is. God is their father, and he is with open arms waiting. Read the story of the prodigal from the Jewish point of view, and it is the father waiting for the return of the son. And he doesn't say, if you get what you deserve, I don't want to see you again. You had your, your chance, you blew it. Now, kill the fatted calf, put on the, the, the <coughs> garments, uh, uh, you know. The robe. The robe, of the, yes, yeah, clothe them. Well, what does the Lord do? He clothes, he clothes in this righteousness. And those of Israel who are going to be saved, who are the believers, will be clothed in his righteousness, wrapped around in his arms, welcomed back into the house, and sit at the table with the Father. Okay. All right, let's see, where am I? Um, okay, so they fell by the sword because the, the enemies fell by the sword. They fell by the sword of the Antichrist, and the enemies of the Lord are going to fall by the sword of the Lord also. According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions, I dealt with them, and I hid my face from them. Okay, that was for a time. Now, why... 
Do we have barriers bearing the bones? Can't just anybody do that? Remember, we're talking Israel. We're talking about going back under law times. During the tribulation, they're going to be living by law again. They're going to be making sacrifices until they can't again. Go with me now. Right. She just said they would become unclean. Go with me to Numbers, but far in our Hebrew. Numbers, and we're going to go to Numbers chapter 19 and verse 16. Chapter 19 and verse 16 of Numbers of the Midbar says, Also, anyone who in an open field touches one who has been slain with a sword, how many died by the sword? Or even those who have died naturally, how many are going to die because of the plagues, because of all the, the horrors that are falling on them? Either way, or a human bone, or a grave. If they even touched a grave, they're considered unclean for seven days. That's a whole week. That week they can't go into the temple of the Lord to worship the Lord because they're unclean. They have to go through a ceremonial cleaning. Well, do you want that to happen every time you come across and touch a dead bone, bury that bone? No. So there'll be those who it will be their job, their occupation. They'll be the ones that can stomach it. Okay? <laughs> and they're going to, um, if, if I see, not me, because it's the, the earthly people, but if they see bones that haven't been buried, they stick up a sign. They go on their way to do what they need to do. That sign is like a red flag. Hello, there's bones here, and the barriers will come through, see that, bury them, and go on to the next. Yes? Is this why when you go to a Jewish cemetery, you wash your hands after you leave? <laughs> yes, I'm sure it is their way of trying to be clean. clean. <clears throat> yes, yes. And it is why the family will be separated during a time of when they're sitting Shiva. That's sitting for a week, mourning the death of their loved one. You know, all of that plays into law and 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 their their way of interpreting the law. But yes. In the Philippines, where we are uh, after coming home in funeral, you go to the house of the uh, dead and they wash you with uh, uh, water and vinegar. You think. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
is, is paragraphs. It's like a letter being written. And so we are moving right on from that carnage being eaten then or also and what else is happening now i saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand now before i separate and tell you what that's talking about let me tell you again you're going to hear six times in the next six verses you're going to hear thousand years thousand years thousand years thousand years thousand years thousand years i think i'm short by thousand years <laughs> okay you're going to hear it six times in six verses. Now, sure. I said to you. What question? Why Why was this happening? Why is this happening? The, the eating of the flesh and, and, and the bones. To keep disease from being prevalent on the face of the earth because a dead body brings disease rapidly, pestilence and disease. So it's God's way of, of helping them clear it very quickly. He's not just supernaturally zapped and they're gone, disappearing like the witch that wiggles her nose and it disappears. <laughs> he, he is using the earthly means to cleanse the land and to do it. And he's going to destroy the earth. <laughs> that doesn't come yet. That's, that's, that's down the line. And yeah. we'll see what that destruction is like. Is it complete? Is it totality? Is it partial? Is it... Well, let's find out when we get there. <laughs> okay, but at this time, we're going to have this earth for a thousand more years. And when I say we, please know, know to that I'm not meaning us. I've got to watch how I say it because I don't want to give you the wrong signal. Let me declare and make it clear. We, we, right now, believers in Yeshua Jesus, who have Jesus in our heart for forgiveness of sin, are listening for the shofar blow, blow from heaven to be caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. That's where we'll be forever with the Lord. And that's what it says. So shall we be forever with the Lord. It doesn't say we go for a time, we go for a visit. Wouldn't that be normal? Can you imagine? Oh, I mean, it had to take it everything within the Lord to leave heaven to come down to earth for the period of time he knew he was going to come down from his humanity. I can't imagine that, but I think it takes big God to be willing to leave. You get me home and have no. Oh, <laughs> Those gates are made of pearl. I got the right thing. <laughs> so when I say we, I'm talking about the people who are on the earth at that time. I'm not meaning us. We, I think I've made it very clear, return with the Lord and we will rule and reign with the Lord. Now, I have asked and I fully expect because the Lord says, whatever you ask, you receive, right? <laughs> In the millennium, I will be leading tours of the land of Israel. So we will see it like you've never seen it. Come sign up for one of my tours. <laughs> so that's, you want to find me? That's where the Lord is going to plant me. Okay. <laughs> and I will be in the choir. <laughs> and it's going to be a choir like I've always Okay. The people on earth are the people. And we're going to go extensively into that also. Who populates the millennial kingdom? Who goes into that kingdom? How does it get started? Who's at the end of it? We'll look at that. We're going to go into a chapter in Matthew 25, and we can take you through that whole chapter also. At first, I wasn't going to, and the Lord put it on my heart. And I'll give it to them in detail, because there's too much out there, again, that doesn't make it clear. And then when you confuse things, you'll end up saying, which end am I on? Where do I go? How do I fit? Well, no confusion here, okay? We want to spell it all the way out. So, we will be ruling and reigning with the Lord. People on earth are who we're going to be ruling and reigning over because the Lord has a, a, an earthly kingdom. He is ruling from Yerushalayim, comma, Israel, <laughs> political era, okay? If the Lord says something once, we know it's important. If he says it twice, listen. If he says it a third time, I think he's saying, get this through. By the time he says it a fourth and a fifth and a sixth time, I'm taking him at his word. I'm taking that he means what he says and he says what he means. Why do I say that? Because there's all kinds of views that take away from a thousand year millennial rank. Well, if it's not a thousand years, why did God say it in two, three, four, five, six, and seven? Why did he spell it out if he didn't mean it? And if he doesn't mean it here, then what does he not mean over here? So, 
I think I've settled it for all of us. We know there is a literal thousand year earthly reign. Okay? Earthly reign. Catch that up. The kingdom of heaven on earth. What's the kingdom of heaven? God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven, we say in Matthew 6. Here it is. Okay? Now, why in Matthew 6 if it takes all the way to Revelation 20 to get there? Because <laughs> remember what that church age looks like, and we just think about a little. These lines here, what does that look like in English? Parentheses. Parentheses. An interruption. Remember, if we take that out, and I don't have one of my soft charts, we have this here, though. This is the way Israel saw the plan. Roger, i got to borrow you for a minute. Or Tony, Tony's doing it. Okay, you can just hold that side for just a moment. Upside down. <laughs> okay, and we're going to find a way to make this stay, but... This is the way here. Let's come up against the board. That way we can hold it tight because mine wants to come up on Okay. This is the way Israel saw it. They did not see that interruption, that parentheses, okay? They see it just go straight through. Right, right. In the Old Testament, yes. All the way through the Gospels. The Gospels don't know about the church, so don't put the church in there, okay? Remember when we did Matthew 24? And it said, it said that two are in the field, one's taken and the other's left. How many of you have heard wonderful sermons on that being the rapture? Everybody in here? <laughs> but when you know that the one who is taken, it says it was as it was in the days of Noah. How were they taken in the days of Noah? In the flood. In the flood. Was that a picture of a rapture? No. Or judgment? Judgment. Judgment. So when two are in the field and one's taken away, is it <clears throat> judgment? The other goes into the kingdom. There's one of your hints of who's going to go into the kingdom. We have to keep it consistent. You have to think with your Jewish mind, and you have to realize Matthew knew nothing of this church age. Neither did Mark, neither did Luke, neither did John. There's one hint in John that, that God gave him something that I believe he kind of went, huh, <laughs> and didn't fully understand but it foreshadows and looks hard. But other than that, all of this, you have to think of the Gospels without our age. So in Matthew 6, when Yeshua is talking to his Talmudim, and he's working with them, he's talking about Israel's plan. And he's telling Israel, the kingdom is going to come. If he told them, oh, by the way, there'll be at least 2,000 years before it does, and there's going to be a whole other people that are going to be brought in, and in fact, Israel... You're not going to be the head. These people are going to be in control, and it's going to be the saving of another flock that I have that I'm not going to do away with you, but I'm going to graft them in and then bring you back because through them, hopefully, you're going to be jealous for me or want me. They would have said, what? Well, then you're not offering us the kingdom, Lord. We're not supposed to look to the kingdom. It's not happening now. So why are you telling us about it? We don't even care about it if it's not going to count. But for Israel, it was a genuine offer because had they accepted their Messiah, the kingdom would have come. Now, had that happened, God would have taken care of the dear Gentiles because we read that he died for them before the foundation of the world also, the same as the Jew. So he never would have left out what has happened during this time called the church age. He just would have done it in some other way because God's a mastermind. That God knew. And in his master plan, he hid that part from Israel so that it was a legitimate offer. So when you have the apostles starting in Acts 2, they've got the power of the Holy Spirit on them, and they're going out and they're preaching the gospel. But notice what they're preaching. They're preaching about the kingdom of God still. They're preaching uh, about the Messiah and the rejection of the Messiah. It's a legitimate offer all the way through until Stephen is martyred. That's why we see when heavens open up, the Lord is still standing. He had not yet sat, because if the nation of Israel would have said, hey, wow, we're waking up, we blew it, we want to embrace our Messiah, he would have come back to them, because he was legitimately being offered to them. But God knew. The same way he knows that we talked earlier about whether your heart would turn to him if he tempted you. And so he chose you. Remember, he does it all. We just get the benefit. 
but in that same way, they were being offered legitimately. So Matthew 6 is telling them, the end of the age is going to come. At the end of the age, Messiah is going to come, and he's going to set up his kingdom. Now remember, they're still looking for a Messiah to set the kingdom now while he's with them. They're not getting this sacrificial side. They're not getting Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, and so many other places. They should have. They should have been able to understand that. But I can't fault them any more than look at how much we struggle in understanding, and we have the scriptures, and we have the full picture, and we can study it whenever we want. Remember, they didn't have some of those privileges. But they're at the feet of the master, and he's teaching them, and he's teaching them, and he's bringing them. And if I jump you from Matthew 6 to Matthew 24, the first couple of verses, you understand why when he's telling them, they're saying, look, look, Yeshua, look at our beautiful temple. Isn't it gorgeous? Yeah. You know what's going to happen to it? Not one stone's going to be left on top of another. What? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is where we go to worship God. This is the place where we meet God. How can this be destroyed? Hey, I don't get that. I don't like that. Keep it. When, when he catches the Lord saying he's going to suffer and die, may it never be. I'm not going to let it happen. No. You're not only going to let it happen, you're going to deny. No. I, I, I'm with you, Lord, all the way to death. Well, he meant that. He meant that. I don't pick on Kepa. He's as human as the rest of us. I'm glad he's in scripture. He, he helps me know God puts up with me and my <laughs> little <laughs> missing the mark, too. <laughs> so they say to him, When's that going to be? If the temple's going to be destroyed, when's that going to be? When are you going to set up your kingdom? These are the questions that came and asked him privately. Tell us, when is the end of the age? Now, to that Jewish mind, the end of the age means the ushering in of the millennial kingdom. When is that going to be? What are the signs of your coming? And he says, okay, boys, pull up a chair. Let's pull up a blade of grass. Let's sit down right here and let's have a great lesson. And he gives them what we have been studying how many times in the book of Revelation have I taken you to Matthew 24? Again and again and again. Guess what? We're at the end of 24. The 25 follows 24, doesn't it? And remember, Matthew wrote a letter. He didn't write chapters and verses. He wrote a letter. So 25 is going to tell us, because 24 brings us the Son of Man coming, 2430, east to west seas, all I see, he comes in power and glory. Guess what? Now we start chapter 25. So when we go into the parables of 25, we're being told who's going into the kingdom. And when you keep that in mind, and you, yes, you can apply lessons that we can learn from those parables, but you don't put yourself into that time, now there's no confusion. You won't believe that you can lose your salvation or anything else that you should not believe because you keep it in who it was for. If it was written to Israel for it to be fulfilled by Israel, then don't go stealing Israel's promises. If you're going to steal their promises, then also steal their curses. Mm -hmm. It's funny how they don't want to do that part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but notice, the whole Bible is for us. We can glean from every, from Bereshit, chapter 1, Genesis 1, to Revelation 22. We can glean all the way through. It's all for us. But it wasn't all to us. Who did Shaul Paul write to when he wrote to <coughs> Ephesus, when he wrote to Colossae, when he wrote to Thessalonica, or Thessaloniki, I'm learning how to say it right. Pray for Emily. She's in the mission working in, in uh, Thessaloniki right now. Pray for her whole team. Who is he writing to? Is he writing to the children of Israel? No. But who is Yeshia writing to? Who are these others writing to? Who did Matthew write to? Did Matthew write to a church? There was no such thing as a church. He wrote to the Jewish people. Matthew's a great one to use with our Jewish people because it's very Jewish minded. I wonder why. <laughs> so when we keep it and we realize and we understand and we learn from it all, we draw principles from it all. I can go back and draw principles from any book anywhere. And I love, oh, I love it. I can't wait till I get to hear it in detail. I love the Rotomaeus. 
If you don't know the road of Emmaus, Yeshua has resurrected. He's walking with two men that don't even see who he is. Their eyes are still blinded to the truth. They are sad. They are depressed. The Lord has been crucified. Their world is falling apart, and they just don't get it. And I imagine they're walking about like this. And he comes alongside, and he starts talking to them. You know, what's the matter, guys? Where have you been? Haven't you heard what's happened this week? I default. <laughs> okay, well, that's very interesting. But, you know, one of our prophets made this comment. And it says that he went all through the scriptures teaching them. I think he started with Bereshit, and I think he took highlights out of everyone. I can't wait to hear. I can't wait to hear. And what did it do with those men? The same thing it's doing in me right now. God's so excited. As Rowena said, their eyes open. When he break, uh, gave the blessing to break the bread, I think the blessing is what gave it away. Communication between the Father and the Son, can you imagine? We pray, but not like he prays. <laughs> I mean, he's one and the same. Wow. All of a sudden they get it. Oh, now we understand Isaiah. Now we understand Daniel. Now we understand that. All of it now made sense of all that came alive. They were so excited. They ran all the way back to tell their friends, I love it. That's a true friend that wants to share. Not going to wait for morning. Not going to wait for the taxi. Not going to wait for a, an easier way to go. They had to share it. They were exploding with it. We should be so excited Amen. with what the Lord has done and what he has said to us from Genesis to Revelation that we want to be shouting to the world. There's a love letter written to you. Let me tell you, do you need to feel loved today? Do you need a, an answer to your problem? Are you confused? Can you not figure it out? Do you need guidance? Do you know there's a road map? Do you know what the Bible is? B-I-B-L-E. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Do you know that will tell you where you're going? That will tell you how to get there. And that will tell you everything you need all along the way. I don't care what problem you throw at me. The answer is in here. That's what this is. That's what we've got. That's the excitement. Hallelujah. Why do we need to know about the millennium? Because I need to know all those promises God made to my forefathers, to my great, great, great granddaddy, and I'll claim him because I love to. Do I need to know that every single one of those words is true? Yes. Because if it's not, I'm not going to get up here and tell you, you are saved by asking the Lord into your life and guaranteed heaven with him when he is your savior. I can't do that if these words fail, because then these words can fail. That's why I'll harp on this, why I'll get on this, and why I'll say over and over and over and over again, thus says the Lord. Yeah. And if the Lord says it, put your feet on it. It is the solid rock. Amen. Oh, rock, spoon. I remember that rock all the way back to Moshe's day when he hit it and living water flowed out. And by the way, <laughs> If you want to picture a little rock, try giving two and a half plus million people water out of a little rock. That had to be a huge gusher. <laughs> and it followed them to where Joel Paul says in the New Testament that rock followed them. Followed them. Led them. Was under their feet. Fed them. Took care of them. And who is that rock? The rock of my salvation. That's Yeshua and Jesus. We got one story, people. One story from beginning to end is all about Yeshua, his relationship to Israel, and through Israel to the rest of the world. It's just simply God's order. So, is it important that I can see all of those prophetic scriptures fulfilled in the millennium? It's huge. It's huge. Now, that's one side of it. Let me give you the other side of it. We live in a world that is loud and clear, saying, the Jew is back. The Jew rejected their Messiah. God's done with the Jew. Bad Jew. Away with the Jew. Look at the church. Ah, oh, the church has done it all. They're great. They put on everything that Israel rejected and they're just living an exemplary life. They're God's chosen people now. Now, I make them fun, but I'm not because at the same time it breaks my heart because it tells them not to share with my Jewish people. And it tells them 
that there's no hope for my Jewish people and there's nothing further from the truth. This is called replacement theology, and I'm going to warn you, you may be sitting in what you believe to be a very good church, and if you dig into his doctrinal statements and his beliefs, you may find out replacement theology is in there. It's all the way back to our early church fathers. It's permeated in many directions. So I will speak long and loud and hard. If God can change his mind, if he can turn his back on the Jew, and replace them with the church, then you church who think you're doing so great, who somebody recently said, with all these churches in San Bernardino, why is it drug infested? Why is it, I'm not going to say how bad they said, but why is it in as bad a shape as it's in? With all those churches, it ought to be thriving. It ought to be doing great. If the church were doing its job, it would be great. If we really were showing the world as Christians, hey, you don't need those drugs and that alcohol. Look at my life and watch how I weather the storms and how I come through and how God works everything out for my good. If we were shining examples, and I mean, I'm, I'm blanking it because there are those of us who are really trying. But if we were really doing it, the world would be running to get saved. The world would be saying, I want what you've got. Now, many of you, I hope, have had that joy of leading someone to the Lord where that is partly what won them to the Lord, was your own testimony, that they saw in you and said, what you've got, I want. Because that's what we should be showing. That's what we should be doing. But if you're being taught in your churches this opposite, then you're going to swallow that lie. Oh, God's done with Israel. Then you've got to say, okay, wait a minute. Then if the church isn't doing that good, Maybe God's going to get fed up with the church too and come up with a, another plan. Do you know God never has plan B? No. Never. Never. Gentiles, you've been grafted in. We're not plan B. You're plan A. Plan A according to his perfect plan. God is the same yesterday and today and forever. He keeps every word. We can thank God. The church gets its promises. Israel gets its promises. And if you try to confuse the promises, you will be in trouble because Israel's given earthly promises and the church is given heavenly promises. Simple and quick to the point so that we can get on with Revelation is Ephesians. Uh, somebody look it up for me. Um, Google it, Roger. Citizenship in heaven. is Philippians. 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 I want to say 320. Try that and see if I'm right, somebody. Uh, but anyway, we know the verse that says our citizenship is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Is it Philippians 3.20? Thank you, Lord. Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is in heaven. What's this real promise? As a nation. I'm not talking individuals. I'm talking as a nation. Israel has promised what we're reading right now, what we're going to go into, the millennial kingdom. They're promised a kingdom on earth. They're promised... The Lord sitting on David's throne. 1 Samuel chapter 7. Where's the second 7? Boy, I can't believe my brain. I'm spinning too fast. Um, it's chapter 7. Slow <laughs> down. I want to get back to the millennium. 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7. And you can start about verse 12, I would say. If you start at 12 and you read it on, you'll see. Um, let me just read you verse 13. He, meaning the Lord, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's just one promise. If God isn't going to do that, then how do I know salvation's forever? See the importance and see the difference? Israel's promise, that's uh, 2 Samuel 7, start with chapter 12. Start with verse 12. 2 Samuel 7. Start with verse 12 and go at least through 17. You might want to keep going. But at least that section right there. Uh, it, it makes it very clear. And that can be cross-referenced all over other places also. So Israel's promised earthly promises will be fulfilled in the land. She's promised a king sitting on the throne of David on earth. Now, at the same time when he's sitting on this throne, he is sitting on the heavenly throne. He is not the throne. Remember the throne in heaven is a love seat. Who sits on that love seat? God the Father and God the Son with all the love for all the rest. But they are the only ones. They are equal. The Son is at the right hand of the Father right now. He will come down bodily, 
sit on an earthly throne, we will see the play of the two thrones when we get further on the other side of the millennium. But uh, God is awesome. He is amazing. And he keeps every word. Okay? So getting back to our millennium, where we are now, knowing why this is important and why I will go through it in detail. Let me bring you out just the three major views. Two views I'll throw out immediately for you, and we'll stay with our one. First view is called Ah Millennialism. Okay, you just put an A in front of the word millennial, and that's basically what it means. There's no millennial. It's all an allegory. It's all an interpretation that's not to be taken literally. If you want to put it on the board. Uh, ah. I spelled it right. We're close enough. Okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm looking for whether it's an A in there or an E. It may be an I E, but A looks right, I think. Is it right? Okay. 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 So it's all allegory. We learn great lessons. None of it's literal. Don't take a bit of it literal. There is no millennium. Don't look forward to it, Jewish people. It's not coming. Uh, again, replacement theology. Church took over. God's filled everything he's going to. The church gets it now. Remember, they don't do anything about the curses that Israel has to deal with either. Second view is called post-millennial. Okay? Post and millennial. See here, when I say millennial, I think it's spelled with an E. That's why it confuses me. I'll put it both ways. You'll find it if you look it up. That, it says, post means after so this is the one that says, after a thousand years of wonderful rule and, and wonderful, well, not rule and reign, but wonderful peace on earth, then the Lord will return because we've prepared the earth for our, our coming of our Lord, okay? And if that's true, God help us all. Is this world getting better? Is it getting any more peace on the face of its earth? No, it's going the opposite direction. It says it's going to get worse. Yes, it's going to get yes. worse. But the, that this is the way that they see it, you know, and, and the way they will interpret it. Third view is our view, the same way we were pre-trib, we are pre-millennial. Okay, pre-millennial. This is our view, this is the view that the Lord is going to return just before the start of the millennium. That's why it's called pre. We're raptured pre-trib. I believe that we're raptured and tribulation starts almost immediately, if not immediately. The Lord returns Millennial starts immediately. There's not time in between. Okay? So the premillennium is the second coming of Yeshua before the thousand year reign. The second coming, um, it, well, premillennial, you would have second coming. Near mid, near mid and then the thousand. And then it starts. The second coming, I'll put it that way, it starts yeah. a thousand year reign. Right. What are you asking, Pam? Oh, the mid, the mid millennium, the mid post. Uh, uh, there is a yeah, one. My mid, mid, rapture, mid rapture. That's mid -rapture. where you're We're talking about. The middle of the tribulation. That's tribulation. We're talking millennium. Okay, we're not oh, talking. Millennium. Yeah, we're oh, talking okay. millennium. This well, is not. Millennium. This is not trip. Okay, you have pre-tribulation. Okay. Because yeah. this is where I think Pre Pam went by accident. Okay. Pre-tribulation, mid, and post. Okay. And they define all of these on, um, how am I going to put it? I'll put it in purple this way. I'll put rapture question. Wherever they put the rapture depends on their view. Yeah. Those who believe like I do, believe the rapture occurs, the before, tribulation pre, starts, yeah. we're pre. Before. Okay? before the tribulation, pre. I believe those who believe it happens in the middle call themselves mid-tribulationists. Yeah. Those who believe that the rapture comes at the end, just before the thousand years start, are called post-tribulationists. This one, they literally have to be raptured up and turn around, come right back down. Boom, boom. Yeah. <laughs> Bless you. God, they can do that, do. but why? Yeah. And where do you fit in getting our rewards? Because we come back wearing our rewards. How do we wear them? How do we come back if we haven't gone and had the judgment seat of Christ? 
So this one gives no time. If mid was true, why does God say at the midpoint to the believers in Jerusalem, go hide? Why doesn't he say, look up, here's your rapture? Why does he tell Israel, the book of Isaiah, when he's prophesied many times ahead, hide yourself until the indignation is complete? Indignation, wrath. What is tribulation? Wrath. Hide yourself until the wrath is complete. If the Lord is coming back for Israel or setting up his kingdom at midtime, then the Lord would say, look up, here I come. Your kingdom will start. Everything will be fine. Hang tight. No worries. But we don't read that anywhere. Now, one simple explanation from my view. There's many, many more scriptures I give you when I go into the full teaching. But this is tribulation. Now we're talking millennial. Okay? Remember in our chart, I'll just do the little one. The time of the tribulation here, second coming, now we're talking about millennium, okay? So, pre, 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 okay, pre trib rapture is here, mid would be right here, post would be right here, okay? They're all dealing with tribulation. Now we're talking in the millennium, they're talking about, there's no real millennium, that's this first view. Second view says, after a thousand years, of peace on earth and, and people doing right and looking for and accepting the, the Lord, then he'll return. I can't see that at all. Last view, premillennial, has his second coming as this red line is just ahead of going into the millennium. That is really his coming that starts and sets up yeah. the thousand years of peace. And believe me, I think it's going to take the Lord sitting and rolling to keep that peace, because humankind is still going to be human. They're not going to have Satan, Satan, running around loose doing his evil. We're going to talk about that. But sin is still in that world. There is still the self-will. There is still, there's still going to be reason for judgment. We'll see that. Okay, so let's get started with it, and that will help us see. So the post-millennium would refer to soul sleepers? Mm -hmm. The ones that believe in soul sleep? Soul sleep, they believe in soul sleep from now all the way through. Where do they put it? I don't know. I don't even know where they sleep. I don't understand. I believe that they must put it at his second coming, that that must be, what, that they're asleep in the grave until he comes back here. I think that must be. Maybe they do believe they wake up to go into the kingdom. Because they believe they're in the grave for a thousand right. years. Oh, if they believe for a thousand years, then they're taking it all the way through the millennium, too, I would think. Um, I have to go look that up again. I'm going to see why. But regardless of where they put the thousand years, you know, where, where they start and stop it, it's not soul sleep. Paul makes it very clear to be absent from the body, yeah, present with the Lord. Five times, you said. <laughs> and the number of grace. <laughs> okay, so is, the scripture never gives room for it when it says that they sleep. That was a euphemism the same way we say today they passed away. Okay, did they really pass away? You know, when you think of that in its literal terminology, no, no, they died. But that sounds so harsh. I'm dealing with a family grieving right now. I'm dealing with one who's lost his mate of 66 plus years. I'm not going to say, I'm sorry jo Joanne passed away. You know, I'm sorry she's dead. No, I'm going to say, I'm thrilled Joanne's in heaven. I can't wait till we get to join her. Hang on, Jim. In fact, as she was going, I was telling her because it was her dad that led my dad to the Lord. So this, these families are close through all the years. So I told Joanne when I knew she was going, and she's not responsive, but I get near here. And I said, okay, I, I get it. I know you're going home, Joanne. I'm thrilled for you. When you get past the Lord's face, and you can look past that, and you see your mom and your dad and your loved ones that, that have gone before you and all, you know, that entourage. Then when you get to here and you see my mom and dad, because I know they're there waiting to greet her in too. When you get past all of that, then just look over your shoulder because they'll be right there. You know, we're coming that soon, I believe. That's our hope and that's what, how I'm going to praise it and look at it. But that was their way of saying when, when, when um, they were Lazarus, Go back in Yeshua's time, you know, when he was walking on the earth. And he told his Talmudim, Lazarus sleeps. I need to go to him. Lazarus sleeps. 
Oh, it's good he's sleeping. You know how we feel when somebody's sick? Good, they're sleeping, they're resting, they're healing. It's good. And, and Lord has turned to him and say, he's dead. Okay? <laughs> he makes it very clear. When they said they sleep, they meant them dead. When they said to, that David would sleep with his fathers, or Joseph sleeping with his fathers, he's not crawling in bed with his, his father and his grandfather. He's dead. Okay? And we'll say it harshly and cruelly here. So it's just the way they said it to, to make it sound gentle. You know, make it easier. Same way we use passed away today. Eric? Yeah, I, I'm a little confused. What about the ones that are the non-believers that are going to be at the great white throne judgment? Okay. So where are them people all this time? Okay. If they are have they already sleeping? died, they're in the heart of the earth. So and they're sleeping or? No. They, they are not sleeping. They are in what I will call a holding tank. When, when we first looked at this, so I'll just do it short, I'll get you all the scriptures later. There is a place in the heart of the earth called Sha'ol. Here, I can just yeah, get it right here. Okay, Sha'ol. Yeah. Oh, That's yeah. the yeah. Hebrew word, okay? Sha'ol has two areas, okay? Two chambers, two tanks, two whatever you want to call them. There is a great gulf in between. Okay. Yeah, you're talking about a Lazarus and a rich yes. man? Yes, Luke okay. 16. Yes. Okay, and any time the Lord gives a real name, it's not a parable. It's not just a story. It's yeah, right. fact. Yeah, when he tells just stories to teach objects, he doesn't use real names. So yeah. he named Lazarus, and he said Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom. I'm going to put that in green, okay? I could do blue, but blue is happening. Abraham, A-B-R, okay, so Abraham's bosom. And he said, Lazarus is there. Lazarus in his life on earth was poor. He sat the beggar's gate. He suffered. He is now in the comfort of the bosom of Abraham. He is not suffering anymore. He's not asleep either. He's awake and he's alert. He's aware. Over on this side, which is this also called in the Greek Hades, which is equivalent to what we'll call hell, even though it's not exactly because it'll be cast into hell. But we have the suffering compartment. In this suffering compartment, in Luke 16, we have the rich man. The rich man, <coughs> thirsty, hot, miserable, looks up, sees in the distance Lazarus. And it's wonderful for Lazarus. Oh! Can you just tell Lazarus to just come in and dip his finger in the water and put on my tongue? I just, just, just touch my tongue. I was so thirsty. And I said, no one can cross between. Okay? But do you notice they're alive? Do you notice they're not sleeping? They're not unaware? They're alive on both sides in a place of contentment, in a place of suffering. Now, when it says that the sign of the Son of Man is as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish, so would the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth? He went into, this is in the heart of the earth, he went into Sheol. But he did not go to the suffering side. He went into the side called paradise by the Lord. He said to the thief on the cross, today... You will be with me in paradise. This is not paradise. No, no, no. Suffering is not paradise. Today you'll be with me in paradise. So we know this is the side the Lord went into. There are those again who teach, oh, the Lord went into hell. He no. suffered the fires for my salvation. If that's true, then why on the cross was Yeshua's last word saying in the Greek, tetelestai, it is is finished. Finished means done. Okay? It is finished. It means paid in full from the Greek. It's when they stamp the bill, paid in full. It is finished. It is complete. It is done. If he had to go to hell for us, he could not say it was finished on the cross. Plus, we are told no one comes back. Hell. No. Yeah. When we see the false prophet and we see the Antichrist in hell, there is no worry no that they're worry. coming out. When we see Satan is cast into hell, the hurrah that's going to go up from the, the mm -hmm. mouths of all who have suffered through all time at the hands of this one from Adam all the way to the last one are never going to fear that he's going to come back. 
This suffering side, all the people who die ahead of the great white throne judgment, this whole black line is representing them. They will wait in this holding tank until Amen. the great white throne. They will stand before God for their judgment, for whatever degree of suffering they will have for eternity, and they will be cast in the lake of fire. Never come out. This side, paradise, we know. And in short, because it's not our lesson for today, this paradise was carried up into heaven by the Lord. Okay? It's removed from the heart of the earth. It went up. Hallelujah. That's why all Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Yeah. Well, where is the Lord? Is he in the heart of the yeah. earth? No. No. In heaven. He's right. in heaven. So where specifically in heaven? We right know exactly where it is. Right hand of God. Where is God? Has God ever gone in the paradise? No. no. So we know the Lord is in heaven. Hallelujah. That is our home where we go also. What's the difference? Why wasn't it always heaven? Why didn't... Abraham go into heaven? Because Jesus didn't have a way yet. <laughs> <laughs> Remember everything on earth patterned after the heavenly? The mercy seat, the blood of bulls and goats covered but could not wash away forever sin. It covered them. They looked at that and it gave them faith believing that the perfect Lamb of God will shed his blood one day. That will wash away my sin. The blood of bulls and goats cannot wash away my sin. Hebrews makes that very clear. Read 8, 9, and 10 in Hebrews and you'll love it. Okay, why did I mention earlier that we know that Yeshua took his blood, put it on the mercy seat in heaven? Because if he hadn't, we couldn't enter heaven yeah. because we still come yeah. in. We're changed immediately into the immortality. Come on. We're changed immediately yeah. as we enter, yeah. as we go into heaven. Yes. That it was open Thank for us Lord. because the Lord put his blood yeah. there. So that when God looks through that blood, he sees me coming. Yes. And I'm coming so fast yeah. that I can't yeah. believe fast enough. Yeah. Forever. After he put his blood on the mercy seat, there's evidence from verses in Ephesians that he took this paradise. It's called taking captivity captive. That he took yeah. it through the heavenlies, through the prince of the power of the air. He made a way right through, right into heaven. Yeah. Uh, into yeah. Amen. To heaven. Yeah. That's glorious. Now, there are those who still believe that there are some that are to be, that have not received the resurrected bodies. I'll tell you both sides of that when we touch on the resurrections. We talk about the first resurrection in three phases, and I'll give that to you in several ways so you can understand it. And the second one is this line that goes into death. But for right now, I'll leave it right here today and just make it clear. For us in our time period, that we all agree, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Hallelujah. Aware? Oh, yes, we're aware. Amen. Were they aware? Yes, they were. Yes. Okay, All right. <laughs> um, let's look at, oh, thank you, that's wonderful, it, it blesses us all. Um, let's look a little bit at what the Bible tells us about the millennium. Why is the millennium so great? Okay, why are we all excited? Why do the Jewish people want it? What has the millennium over anything else for them? Why are they looking to that? Why are the Talmudim asking the Messiah, when will the kingdom come? Why do they want the kingdom? Okay, well, let's read. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons, isn't it? Okay. Kingdom to come. First of all, coming a Messiah is the only thing that makes it possible. You have no kingdom without the king on the throne. Okay? Yeshia, Isaiah 11, 9. So, uh, and what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start listing on the board those whose testimonies we're reading about, okay? So out of the mouth of Isaiah, Isaiah 11, 1. So who tells us, I'll, I'll just put prophecies of the kingdom, okay? We'll call it that way, prophecies of Israel's kingdom. I'm, gonna, I'm going to make it specific because remember, you're going to use this yes. to silence every mouth that says that God is done and replaced Israel. 
KGD Kingdom. Okay, <laughs> I ran out of room. So our first one is Isaiah. Isaiah 11, 1 to 9. He tells us there's no kingdom if we don't have the Messiah. Okay? Whoa. Isaiah 11, verse 1. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. Yes, 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 And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Okay? Something's going to come out of Jesse. Anybody know who, the Je who Jesse is a great grandfather to? David. David. It's all the way down to David. Yeah. David. Okay. Jesse has David. Da I, actually, I shouldn't say it comes all the way down to it, but Jesse's father of David. Yeah. David is the line for who? Solomon. Okay, but keep going. All the way to, to, to the Messiah. Okay, yeah. Messiah has to come from David's line. David's yeah. yeah. line. So, David came from Jesse. So, this stem, this root that's going to come from Jesse. And I could take you into other scriptures and show you prophetically from the Jewish viewpoint how that is speaking of Messiah, even that he is what comes up out of the dry ground. Okay, but right now we'll just stick with it. He's the branch from his fruits that will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on this, this stem from Yesse, from Yeshe, from Jesse. Oh, catch my breath. Okay, spirit of the Lord will rest on the spirit of wisdom, understanding, the spirit of counsel, and strength, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. What this verse? Is, in 11. Start with verse 1. 11, 1. 11, 1. 11, 1. We're going to read 1 through 9. Okay, that's the Holy Spirit's work in all those in the sevenfold. Is that's anyone else getting true. hot, or is it just me working my own? <laughs> Roger, drop it just a little bit if you can, please. Okay. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees, nor make a decision by what he, his ears hear. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. Who does that? The Messiah. The Messiah. Okay, we certainly don't see it short of that. Look at the next phrase, and you'll know who it is. He will strike the earth with the rod out of his mouth. Didn't we just read that? Didn't we just say it? So we know we're talking about the Messiah. With the breath of his lips, he'll slay the wicked. The righteousness will be the belt about his loins, faithfulness the belt about his waist. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and as my mom would always say, and not in the, lamb, in the wolf's stomach. <laughs> the leopard will lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fat lying together, and a little boy will lead them. Anybody got a little child, a little grandson? You, you want to take him even to the zoo and throw him on the other side of the cage? <laughs> they hear the little child can be playing among them, all of these. The cow, the bear will graze, their young will lie down together, the lion will eat straw like the ox. The lion doesn't eat straw today, folks. I don't want to tell you what the lion is. The nursing child, that's a toddler at best, will play by the hole of the cobra and the winged child, the one that's a little bit older, will put his hand on the viper's den. Snakes will not hurt your children. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wow, a whole earth that knows the Lord, knows the blessings of the Lord, is dwelling in peace. That's our description. How did it start? It started with that root out of Jesse, the stem out of Jesse. So without the coming of Messiah, there isn't all this peace. There isn't this kingdom that we're talking about. Now, I want to give you more witnesses. So go, to me, go with me to Zechariah. Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 14, and there we'll just read verse 9, but I'm going to add his name to my list because he's another voice. Zechariah's what? Uh, 14 verse 9. Zechariah. Okay, in chapter 14 and verse 9 he says, And the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day the Lord will be the only one in his name. The only one. Do we have other kings today? Are there other rulers on the face of this earth today? Yes. yes. Are they not even battling? And will there not be a greater battle for who's going to have the head name? Yes. But in this day, the Lord and the Lord only. Okay? Now, do you remember Revelation 19, 11 to 16? Or do we need to turn back and read it? I think you've got to remember the battle of Armageddon, yes. the Lord coming, sword out of his mouth, right. slaying the wicked, setting up his kingdom. Okay, we've just read it, we've just studied it, but 
Who wrote Revelation? John. 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 Okay, so I've got another witness. I've already got three witnesses. If I'm going to court, I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> and I haven't begun yet. <laughs> now, he's going to roll and reign. He is king, according to these verses. The conquest of all the nations will be achieved. And we're told Alexander the Great conquered all the nations. He was so disappointed there was no one else that he sat down and drank himself to death. He died sad because there were no more kingdoms to conquer. But since Alexander's time, I don't believe we've ever seen the whole world under one rule like that. And Alexander the Great. That was Alexander the Great. And he, nobody could even follow in his footsteps. His kingdom was divided up among four generals because there wasn't anybody equal to that place. And even when Alexander was king, there was not peace over all the earth. And it was a very short time that he had the world as we knew it at that time and had control. But all the nations will be under the rule of the Messiah. This is told to us by Isaiah. We've already got him up there, so I won't put him up again. But let's <coughs> go to Isaiah, Yeshia. I should have told you to keep a finger in it, but go back to Isaiah. Chapter 59 is where we'll start. Isaiah 59. And we're going to start with verse 20. Isaiah 59 and verse 20. Excuse me, we read a redeemer will come to Zion, Zion, okay? Zion, Zion, named for Jerusalem in Scripture. There's going to be a Redeemer come to Israel. Who is the Redeemer of Israel? Jesus. 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 We all know that, yes. Yeshua, Jesus. And to those who turn from transgression in Yaakov, in Jacob. That tells us he's talking about Israel, declares the Lord. Verse 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them. Okay, my covenant with Zion, Jerusalem. My covenant with Jacob, who is representing the Jewish people. My spirit which is upon you, my words which I put in your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. He is talking about a period of time when the parent, the child, the grandchild, and continuing on out of their mouth will declare that the Lord. He is Messiah, and he will be sitting on his throne. He will keep his covenant with them. He will be their redeemer. He will turn their transgression away from them, their sin away from them. We know that's Messiah. We know that that's promised to Israel. Now go with me to chapter 60. Oops. Okay, let's go Isaiah chapter 60. And we're going to go to verse verses 1 through 5 to start, and then we'll go down to verse 18. Okay, arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. If I stop you right there, the light, that's the glory of the Lord. Who is that? Yeshua, Yeshua Messiah, Jesus only. In Hebrews, it tells us that the glory of God is Yeshua. In Psalm, it tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. We know that glory to be Yeshua. We see it all the way through, do we not? So I could put up some more names right now, but I won't, since we're just staying with their books. We've already put Isaiah up there. The old darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness of peoples. When is that? When is it dark? During the tribulation. The tribulation is called the night. Remember, we're children of the day, not of the night. Another proof for pre-trib. Hello. <laughs> But the Lord will rise upon you, his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Okay, now we've, we've got an order. We've got nations coming to the light. We've got kings coming to the light. Who is the light? Yeshua. Yeshua. Jesus. Where is he sitting? On the right The Redeemer comes to Zion. Okay, he's a, right now, yes, he's a, right hand of the Father. But what did we just read? We read that the Redeemer would come to Zion. Zion. Zion is Jerusalem. Okay, Mount Zion's in Jerusalem, but it's the name given in Scripture. When you read Zion, you can put Jerusalem in there. Often yeah. referring to all this trip, but we'll go Jerusalem specific right now. So, the Lord will rise upon you, His glory appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. So the kings are going to come up to to Yeshua while he's sitting on the throne. Lift up your eyes round about and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar. Your daughters will be carried in their arms. Then they will see and be radiant. Then you will see and be radiant. Excuse me. And your heart will thrill and rejoice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The king sitting on his throne in Israel. Here come all the Jewish people back who've been scattered. 
Why were they scattered? Because they didn't receive their Messiah. So they went into exile in that sense. They did suffer the consequences, but out in exile, they came to faith and believed in their Messiah, looked for the day of his appearing, looked for the day he's coming, and he's drawing them all back in. And when we see that happening, we will rejoice with them. We will sing out the hallelujahs. Our hearts will thrill and rejoice. Because, and especially in Israel they will, because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. The nations are going to bring up their wealth and bring it into the temple and sacrifice it to the Lord. Give the wealth to Israel. Right now, they're going to come into Israel in the tribulation to plunder Israel, to take whatever value they can find. If she does prove that she's got that oil, they're going to want to strip her of that oil. They don't want her to have it. They want their own. And remember when the Antichrist moves his headquarters into Jerusalem, they're going to come at him. Hey, he's a little bit weak right now. I don't want him king. I want to be king. I'm going to set yeah. our nation up, so I'm right. going to come and I'm going to snatch my part. They're all coming to pull and to get and to devour. But now it's all going to come. Bring it in. Pour it in. Israel will become beautiful. Israel will have the wealth of the nations flowing into it. And we keep reading. A multitude of camels will cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah. And the, those from Sheba, Shevet, will come. All that south, Egypt, and other areas, they'll bring gold. Gold is great. Frankincense. Yes, the king of Solomon was a good, a good picture. Right, as soon as Lebanon came, they, they brought their riches from Egypt. And, uh, they mined the mines. Oh, my goodness, how far were the mines? You have the, the mines of Timna down in southern Israel. But, um, Queen of the South was... Ethiopia, yes, yes, yes. So all these nations, yes. They'll bear good news of the praises of the Lord. They're all coming together and praising the Lord. I can hardly wait. Have you ever been to a conference or something where they're coming from all over and they're all singing the praises of the Lord? And it lifts your spirit and it's a wonderful place to be and you don't want it to end? Guess what? It's finally not the end. <laughs> All the flocks of Peter will be gathered to you. The rams of Nebuchadnezzar, I don't know if I'm saying all this right, will minister to you. They will go up with acceptance on my altar, and I shall glorify my glorious house. What's the house of the Lord? But during now, millennium, what's the house of the Lord? And where specifically? Okay, but they're all coming with their wealth and coming into the... Temple, that's what I wanted, the house of the Lord. Do we not call the church today the house of the Lord? The house of the Lord is the temple. This is where they're going to come. This is where they're bringing the, their, their wealth and riches in. They'll go up with acceptance on my altar. If I read that, you would have gotten it. I shall glorify my glorious house. Who are these who fly like a cloud and like the doves to the lattices? Surely the coastlands will wait for me. The ships of Tarshish will come first to bring their sons from afar, their silver, their gold with them for the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel because he has glorified you. So all the beauty, everything's coming, is all coming in. It's all conversion. It's all being brought into the temple to the house of the Lord. It's all praise and glory and honor to the king of kings who's sitting on that throne. It is a beautiful picture, and I can't wait. I read far further than I was supposed to. Oh, well. Drop down. Yeah, I got, I got caught up. Drop down to verse 18. Violence. Uh-oh. Here come the guns. Here comes ruin the scene. You got your placid lake scene, and all of a sudden, we're going to... Right? No, no, no. 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 Violence will not be heard again in your land, nor devastation or destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. You may enter in through praise, and the walls are your safety, are your deliverance, are your salvation. Even the walls surrounding will be rejoicing. Remember when the Lord said, if they don't speak, even the stones will cry out? I don't know if he was pointing to temple stones or just stones, period. But here we've got stones called salvation. Okay, so it is glorious. It is being achieved. It will be all the nations coming to it. Salvation of Israel comes immediately, actually before it begins. The salvation of Israel is seen. Again, we're in Isaiah. We'll stay, stay there. Isaiah chapter 62. So go with me to chapter 62. Just a couple pages over. We'll start with verse 1 there. No, start with verse 11. 11 and 12. Behold, 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 the Lord has proclaimed where? 
to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, Jerusalem, Lo, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him, his recompense before him, and they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you will be called, sought out, a city not of our city, not for the city. Hasn't it been the opposite and won't it even be more so for Israel all along? It's not called redeemed, holy. It isn't filled with his reward. It's not a city sought. And in, in tribulation time, we're told Jerusalem's going to be trodden underfoot. It will be forsaken. They will scatter. But here is the opposite. Why? Because the Lord is there. He is behind to the ends of the earth. The Lord is on his throne. Salvation has come to Israel. You ready for a new witness? I've got a new name for you. Uh, I heard it out there. <laughs> Just following the outline. Now you know why I gave you such a long outline, though, and why it's so important. Here's another one. Okay, we have out of the mouth of one, two, three, four witnesses. Daniel, Daniel, chapter 12. And we'll start with verse 2, I think. Yeah, we'll start with one. We'll leave it in context so you can understand. Now, at that time, at a specific time, Daniel's talking about, and remember, Daniel's Jewish. Daniel's, okay, Daniel, he's Jewish. <coughs> he's talking to the Jewish people. When you read the word many in Daniel, he's talking about the Jews. He's not talking about many nations. He's talking about many Jewish people. So, what is Michael, Michael, the great prince, being named? Because he's the one who stands guard over the sons of your people. Who's Daniel's people? The Jews. Who's the guard over the Jews? Michael. 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 He is, it, it seems that angels, archangels at least, are given certain areas that are their targets of work, responsibility. Michael, Michael, who is, um, who is like our God? Yeah, who is like our God? Who is like you, O oh God? Michael, Michael is the one that's looking out for Israel. So, at this time, he's going to arise. There'll be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. What time is that? When's the worst distress over the nation ever? Tribulation. So we know what he's talking about. At that time, your people, the Jewish people, everyone who is found written in the book, what book? The Bible. will be rescued. Now, notice, many... Jewish again. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. Now, is this a scripture that they pull out of context and say, oh, everybody's sleeping? Yes, yes it is. One of the scriptures they use. Yeah, That's not what it meant. But even the lost are not sleeping. Remember when I had down here the suffering side? The rich man was not sleeping. He was not unaware. They, they do not. The body sleeps. The spirit does not. Okay, so Daniel 12, 2, when it says many of those who sleep, again, it's the euphemism. Many of those who die who are in the dust of the ground because the body goes back to death, they will awaken. They'll be brought back is what it's saying. I'm sorry? Many of those will awake these to everlasting life and those to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Now, in that phrase, we have a great period of time. We see that in scripture where we see sometimes there's a part and there's a wait for another part. The ones who are raised to everlasting life, we know, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, when the rapture occurs, the dead in Christ, the dead in Messiah, will arise first. Okay? Those are ones that are rising to everlasting life in heaven. Now, we know that these others that are going to arise to disgrace and everlasting contempt are at the great white throne. So in this scripture, you've got from here to here. Okay, we've got a long ride, at least a thousand and seven years and probably a few more days to boot. <laughs> but we know that that's how long in between. But it makes it very clear. that death come first? Because God said so. <laughs> no, there's six inches they have to come so, <laughs> Yeah, six feet, not six inches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. six feet. Oh, you know, we get along. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
Okay, but, well, <laughs> what are you going to do with this then, Anita? I have a girlfriend that's almost a foot taller than me. And I told her, small things fly fast. <laughs> I'm going to be you. You can have my coattail as I go with me. So even if they get a six foot start, I'm still little. I'm still moving fast. Now, in Daniel 12, too, the word that they're awake, in other words, that they're aware, not that they're asleep, right? That's how I, I, I get it. No? Yes, 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 you're yes. right. It's, uh -huh. it's not, but it's not that they've even been unaware. It's just following through in the vernacular that they're using. Yes. They're going to awake out of the dust of the earth and be with the Lord. Because remember, they're awake. They're not sleeping. So it's just the way that it's being phrased. When Lazarus was sleeping, he was death. Yes. He, four days dead. Lord, you don't want to roll that stone back. He stinks. Okay. Yeah. They knew he was dead. They didn't put him in that grave, put him in grave clothes and close off the, the tomb and think he was going to wake up. That'd be a horror. You know, they knew he was dead. So it's just their way of, of phrasing it. If they're sleeping, they need to wake up. You know, that's what we say. So if they're in death, they're coming out of death. And they're, they're going to be brought up before the Lord. Okay? So, that's Daniel 12, 2. I want to go through verse 3. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the stars forever. And I love this. Like, like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. Those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. You want to shine like a star? Amen. You're leading Amen. Jewish people to the Lord. Now, really, I think it goes to anybody that when it says who lead the many to righteousness, that was Israel being told, those who you're leading them to the righteousness of God, you are like the stars of the heaven. You're going to shine in glory. You're going to be you know, a shining beacon that look what you did. You brought others to the Lord. Okay, And again, we can glean from that. We can learn from that. Okay? Drop down to verses 12 and 13 for help in understanding. It says, how blessed is he who keeps him waiting, um, who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. 1,290 is the second half of the tribulation. They talk about the 1,335. Sometimes they add in the days for um, the, uh, the marriage feast. We don't know exactly on those days. We'll get to that in, in just a bit, I think. I think I touch on it in a bit. But the point is that that he's telling them, those who wait through this time, they're blessed. Those who make it through the tribulation are blessed. But as for you, go your way to the end. Then you, Daniel, you're going to enter into rest. You're going to go to sleep. You're going to die. And you will rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. Notice at the end of the age, when do they rise again at the end of the age? Because there are those who believe that there are uh, those who stay, who do that. In fact, you know what? I'm going to stand corrected because I do believe this to be true. The ones who are the dead in Christ that rise at the rapture, I believe, are in the church age period of time. Okay? Church age. Church age. From, from this point, from here, the Holy Spirit's come on us. The church age has started until the rapture. That the people who die in this period of time are the ones... That Shaul Paul is specifically referring to in 1 Thessalonians 4. It is 4. Why didn't somebody tell me? Oh, yeah. oh, oh it's so interesting. Oh, 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 I got to go with Okay, I got to finish with this thought. And then we'll pick up from this thought forward next time. We'll just, I'll put our names up at the start next time and we'll just keep adding on, okay? That I do have to finish this thought. And I apologize if you need to go, go. But here's the thought, okay? The first resurrection. Not the second. The second is for all the dead. But the yeah. first resurrection, they say, is in three phases. Okay? Now, if I take this into Jewish thought, I know that, at, and we see it at Passover time, okay? Sacrificed lamb has been sacrificed. That's Passover day. The next day, actually three days later, I'm sorry, three days, let's be exacting. On resurrection day is the day that the first fruits are brought into the temple. That's the first of the field that's ripening. It's brought just, the, it's like they grab a handful of books ripening and they bring it in, they wave it before the Lord. It's called the first fruits. When the Lord resurrected from the dead, he is called the first fruits. Even though graves were open when that earthquake and everything happened when he was on the cross, no one came out of those graves till after the Lord had resurrected. He was the first. That was a little sampling of first fruits. That's like that first little gleaming. 
then the majority of the harvest is brought in. The majority of the harvest of the daily of rice is here being raised up. But even as it is for the Jewish people, after the gathering, there's still gleaning that's going on. Remember the poor, the needy were able to glean in the fields, Ruth and yeah. the field of Boaz, okay? They're gathering the last little bit. The majority has been in, but there's the last little bit. That would be those who, who are um, saved after, during the tribulation, et cetera. Yes, that they would be, because they're, we know they're not going to suffer in the second death. So there has to be a phase of resurrection for them when they are brought up. So we'll look at those three. We'll bring it out again next week. I'll bring it out with some scripture references behind it. But that's really what that first resurrection is, is in three phases. So when we talk about, um, and this is where I got off, when we talk about those who are raised later um, and being raised near this time, the tribulation, at uh, the millennial time, that would be that final gleaning of those, okay? So we'll talk about that again next week. I'm losing my song. So I guess Ms. Saints may be part of that. That's what some believe because they weren't part of the rapture. So first fruits went up. Some of them went up after they were seen on the earth. But the rest who were not some of those graves that were open. And I think those would only be the ones who were at that time, who were um, in during that day. Because what testimony is it if you don't know who that person is? It's not a testimony. But if you buried somebody a year ago, two years ago, and they lived in your lifetime, you know who they are, and suddenly they are, they've risen. That's a testimony to you because you know who they are. So it's believed at the, that time when when Christ was resurrected and they resurrected, it was a sampling, but not all of them. If that's true, then those would be the ones raised at this third time, the third phase, phase of it, which is in Revelation 20. We'll read about that. You know, we'll get into the scriptures behind this next week. Okay? So, and I, but I do want to make that clear because I do see it in three phases: um, majority rapture. Okay, dead in Christ, raised first. That you got those before and those who come after. Because they're going to be saved during the tribulation time. We'll see, you know, um, a different time there. Okay? So, let me hold it there. Um, we've got the salvation of Israel here being spoken of. We'll separate that from the church again. I'll just pick up this whole thought again. Right at, at this point, and we'll go into it, and I'll back it up. We'll look at some of the verses in Revelation 20 along with it also. Okay? So am I leaving anybody confused? No. Okay, good. good. But that threw me for a <laughs> Excited, yes. We can hardly wait. Okay. I need to close the prayer. Once I close the prayer, you're free to go. Tony's trying to show you that there are, are different ways our shirts that we're getting done and people want. Um, they bring the shirt to Tony. Tony takes it to who puts that on. It's. Um, it happen? Um, told me how much is it? Uh, the main thing is just fifteen bucks. Fifteen. They have to give it to you. Okay. Okay. You'll you'll have to turn your money to me and trust me. <laughs> if you want a shirt, bring your shirt so you get the actual size, color, style. Everything is your choice that way. But he'll take it. They'll imprint it for fifteen, and. You'll have. It, it's got our um, logo for Emmanuel Israel, the Star of David, the Star of the Cross. It's got the Shofar is on the other side of the Shalom, which is what the Hebrew says on that side also. But a lot of people have been asking Tony, how can I get one? How can I get one? Well, here we go. Okay? okay so submit. Submit to me. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's close the prayer. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah to you, O Lord God. We praise you forever and ever, and we thank you for your eternal plan. We thank you for your faithfulness to your word. We thank you that we know, that we know, that we know, that we will be with you forever, that you will give your eternal plan for Israel, that she will see her king sit on her throne. She will receive her promises, and we will receive our heavenly promises, and we thank you. Oh, how we thank you, because it's not what we deserve, but out of your mercy you give. Out of your grace, you freely give. And Lord God, we are so excited. We just want to be raptured up this moment. We want to be home with you. We want to sing your praises forever and ever. But even now, let our voices match those in heaven singing hallelujah.
God to you Lord. on the eternal throne, our God, our King, our Redeemer, our Savior, our Messiah, Yeshua Jesus. You did it all. Praise you. In your name. Your name. Okay. Well, thank you for Russia. Thank you for you. I get to see what I do.